Welcome to my talk about mitochondria. Mitochondria are my favorite organelles. When you're a nerd like myself, you have favorite organelles and mitochondria is mine. Hopefully you can see why after this little short discussion. Here's a big word for you, endosymbiosis. This is how mitochondria came about. About two billion years ago, there was a cell and it engulfed a bacterium. Uh, that's where the endo comes from, is endocytosis. Once it engulfed the bacterium, it wrapped another membrane around it, and it realized that this uh, thing that it engulfed actually cranks out energy. And so let's, instead of digesting it, let's keep it around and get some kind of synergy going, which is where symbiosis comes from. So the cell worked with this organelle, and it was a win-win situation because the organelle had all these raw materials to pull from, glucose, and then the cell itself got more energy out of the system. And this is where we got our mitochondria, and that's where plants got their chloroplasts from a similar uh, endosymbiotic event. So that's why our mitochondria have two membranes. The inner membrane is all convoluted. It gives it more surface area and that's good because all the electron transport chain proteins are embedded in this inner membrane you can see there to the right that there's five proteins embedded in this membrane and it's called the electron transport chain because they're passing electrons and one is getting oxidated one is getting reduced we'll get into those words a little bit more um, down that chain and then that last little rectangle was APT, A, APT, ATP excuse me, synthase and that's where we crank out 32 to 36 ATP per glucose molecule so it's a big payoff right there in the mitochondria at the electron transport chain. So our mitochondria actually have their own DNA because they were once free living bacteria and like bacteria, it, it, it's circular. Uh, now it only has about 13 genes that uh, all of them belong, make proteins that belong to the respiratory complex. So maybe one of those proteins that we saw embedded in the inner membrane or something like that. Um, it also, DNA both in the nucleus and mitochondria uh, also code for RNA molecules and tRNAs are the RNA molecules that will uh, bring amino acids to make proteins, which the mitochondria has to make its enzymes to make all the chemical reactions take place to make ATP. And then they, uh, the mitochondria also have their own ribosomes, so they need ribosomal RNA. And there's two genes that code for different ribosomal RNA uh, molecules. But the nucleus now makes about 1200 proteins that are used by the mitochondria so they're they're over time over this two billion year period they've become reliant on each other and one can't live without the other and so a lot of the mitochondria genes actually uh, got transported to the nucleus but it still makes a few of its own So the one byproduct of making ATP from glucose using oxygen is free radicals, also known as reactive oxygen species, because these always have oxygen in them. And if you've had any chemistry, you know that oxygen loves electrons. It's, it's one of the most electronegative uh, elements on the periodic table, with fluorine being the only one that's more electronegative. So it wants electrons so bad that it actually steals them if its valence shell, its outer shell, isn't full and stable. So uh, the mitochondria uh, is just through natural ATP generation will make free radicals. Fortunately, we make our own endogenous uh, antioxidant enzymes to buffer these. As long as that balance is, is nice, and we'll talk about that. So right down in the middle, that represents the free radicals. Uh, they're, when they're missing 
an electron, which sometimes happens during the process of oxidative phosphorylation at that electron transport chain. They may um, not uh, um, create water with oxygen, uh, the final electron acceptor. Sometimes they escape at one of the, those four complexes as a free radical, and they're going to try to steal from whatever they can. If we have those antioxidants available, you can have endogenous ones that you make, like glutathione, or you can uh, take and you know eat antioxidant foods such as uh, those that contain vitamin C, like citrus fruits, uh, vitamin E. Nuts are a good source. Those will donate freely, donate an electron before that free radical can steal it from one of our healthy cells. So free radicals can steal electrons from our cell membrane, disrupting the cell membrane. It can steal um, electrons from our proteins, messing up the whole protein. And then uh, it can also get into the DNA and steal electrons from the DNA, which uh, can be detrimental. Anytime you uh, mess with DNA, it, it's not a good thing. So what one thing to consider is that through this two billion year period, the mitochondria and nucleus actually communicate with each other. And more and more research is being uh, elucidated in this area. It's called, there's called retrograde cell signaling where the mitochondria can actually send chemical messengers to the nucleus and either um, upregulate good genes or bad genes based on the signals. So if it's sending a lot of reactive oxygen species, you can see it there as ROS. This can disrupt the nucleus, uh, cause issues with DNA as those electrons get stolen. Um, down at the bottom, you can kind of see where you, you can have a balance and then you can actually have a slight imbalance, which is a good thing. That would be like a positive stress, like moderate exercise which can actually upregulate good genes, but you can also have a severe imbalance. So uh, there's different things that cause increased reactive action species or free radicals. And that includes like air pollution, anti-cancer drugs, uncontrolled diabetes where the blood sugar gets too high, stress, poor nutrition, different things can actually uh, tip this balance, even uh, overtraining can tip this balance to be uh, send reactive oxygen species that, that negatively influence the nucleus. So over time, that can cause dysfunctional mitochondria and that can lead to aging. It can lead to different diseases. It's central to heart disease, uh, cerebrovascular disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, cancer, premature aging, all this can be uh, tracked back to dysfunctional mitochondria. So it's important to take uh, good care of these, these organelles. In fact, uh, one thing that's kind of interesting is when a cell becomes cancerous, a lot of times it goes under the Warburg effect where uh, typically our cells will use oxygen and get that big payoff of 32 to 36 ATP going through oxidative phosphorylation. But it's whenever a cell becomes tumorigenic, you know, cancerous, it will shift its metabolism away from aerobic respiration using oxygen and shift it toward anaerobic re uh, respiration uh, where it uses lactate and only gets two ATP net if you remember from glycolysis. So, uh, it's interesting. That's that's a big part of why when someone's um, saying they have symptoms of cancer, one of the first symptoms is uh, unexplained weight loss because these tumor cells are just taking in all the glucose that we consume and going right to these tumor cells that are cranking out two ATP per glucose, and uh, it, it can drop your weight significantly. One way to kind of, the Cancer is so hard to treat because it just has, uh, it's just our cells. And so it's really hard to uh, target treatment toward cancer cells. But the ketogenic diet has been one way 
that might be a good adjunct to chemotherapy because you can get into ketosis where you're using fat as fuel and fat has to go through aerobic respiration and uh, someone with cancer, the tumor cells can't, some of those tumor cells can't use ketones as a source of fuel. So it can almost kind of starve the tumor from having adequate glucose because your glucose levels drop when you're in ketosis. And um, it can allow those ketone bodies to go to our muscle tissue and brain and heart and give us adequate nutrients to those tissues. So it's a nice way to, to uh, kind of put some stress on tumor cells.